So this is the PAGR training for uh, Fedora Program Management Team. Um, the first question that always comes up is how do you pronounce it? And the joke works a lot better in text format, uh, but it's pronounced when you type the name out. Uh, there is actually an old repo with you know how do you pronounce it where people have submitted pull requests of their different pronunciations, which is kind of amusing. Uh, so PAGR is a Git forge that uh, was developed in the Fedora project and is used by um, both Red Hat sponsored and non-Red Hat sponsored projects now, um, including some personal use uh, by Neil Gampa on his own server. Uh, so you know, really the idea is a Git forge in the sense of like GitHub or GitLab, that kind of style. So you know, it's really focused on uh, source code management and tracking issues and things related to that. Uh, but it has also grown to be used as a codeless ticket tracker uh, by a lot of groups in Fedora because it you know, has issues and it uh, you know, provides sort of a unified tool. Um, in recent years, it also added a basic Kanban board feature, which we'll talk about a little bit. When you're using it for issues, there's an issues tab across the top. And it's sort of you know what you might expect from a issue tracker, um, you know. So you can create a new issue, you give it a title, and then you give it a description. Um, you can do some formatting, and it uses a basic markdown syntax. And there is a link to the documentation here at the bottom. So you can do things like lists, um, numbered list links. Um, you can mention sp specific people by typing at and then their name and it will search through. So you can search by their user ID and then um, you can also preview it. So this again sort of gives you a live render. You can make sure the, the formatting does what you expect. Um, if you're familiar with Markdown, it can be very flexible but also sometimes just a little persnickety. Um, a lot of the implementations just aren't quite robust enough. Once you're happy with it, you can create issue. Um, you can make it private. Um, and some repos will default to using private issues if there are things like the code of conduct tracker, tracker where you want to make sure that people don't accidentally make things public that they shouldn't be. Um, so once you create the issue, there's comments. And again, the comments follow the same formatting. Uh, you can also edit it, which is nice. Um, the thing to be forewarned here is that when you're editing, um, it doesn't make it clear what edit was made. Um, so you can't really go back and see a diff very well. Um, it has tags or labels, so you can apply um, pre-configured tags to things. Um, you can set it uh, that it blocks another issue in the repo. Um, and so you could search the, by the name. Um, you can't search, unfortunately, across repos, as far as I can tell, for the issue blocking and dependencies. Um, but you can also um, uh, set it to private again here. So you can sh toggle the private status if you have access to edit the metadata. We'll talk about the metadata access here when we talk about the administrative side. Um, most repos by default don't let users edit the metadata, um, but some will. And if, depending on the level of access you may have to the repo, you can do that. Um, if, there, if it's configured, you can also have milestones. So if we look at another board real quick, there are milestones configured. And so, for example, I have set a milestone of uh, F34 for the Mindshare election interviews. Um, you can also set the close status when you comment. It comes with some defaults. Um, you can customize those, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Uh, and there are also custom fields that can be set. Most repos I found don't do that. So the Fedora badges repo makes use of this by having um, basically uh, 
binary fields for if um, the different stages of the badge development, which things are done, which aren't. Um, and this allows the team to be a little more rich in the status without having to sit there and parse through all of the comments. Some repos will also use a priority field. Um, and these are customizable attributes just you know, sort of indicate which ones are the most important issues to work on. Um, I found in practice that most times that really doesn't get um, paid attention to, but it is there if a team wants to use that uh, to indicate you know, relative priorities of tasks that need to be worked on. One other thing to note about issues is that um, you have subscribers, so you can basically get email notifications about an issue. Um, people who are members of the repository and the person who creates the issue are subscribed by default. But if there's a repository that you're not a member of, but you still want to pay attention to that issue and get notified of updates, um, there is a subscribers thing here, and this will say subscribe if you are not already subscribed, and you can click that, and you will be subscribed to it. Pagger also has sort of the same, you know, Git repository features that you would expect, um, you know, apart from just the issues. So you can browse the code tree of a repository and see the files. Um, you can edit a file in the browser if you need to. Um, if you have a fork, you can edit in your fork. You can do, you know, sort of the normal um, git history and um, git blame that you would do. Um, you can look at individual commits. Um, you can look at the different branches, of course. Uh, you can see who has forked it. Uh, and you can look at the release tags. Now, these are Git tags, which is separate from the um, tags used for issues and pull requests, which are you know, strictly you know, metadata unassociated with the Git repository. Um, so these tags actually come from when you do a Git tag and then the tag name. Uh, and these will show up as releases. So you can do the things that you expect to do with a Git repository. You can do a Git pull. You can you know, edit a file, do a git commit, do a git push. And so once you push, your commit will show up in the commits. Um, if you have a fork, when you do a git push to your fork, um, it'll automatically pop up the link in the output to create a pull request. So here I have a fork. You can create a pull request from your branch. Um, I've actually just done this in my branches up to date. But um, you know, it's just sort of the same. You fill out which branch you're coming from, which branch you're going to, you put in the description. And pull requests have the same um, labels associated with them, the same tags that issues do. Um, so that can be useful in you know how a team does its workflow where you know if um, a pull request is tagged against a certain set of functionality, um, both the issue and the uh, pull request may receive that tag. So optionally, you can have a roadmap where you assign issues to certain milestones. Um, and this allows you by default, it shows the active and it also shows, inactive milestone. So you can basically target issues towards that milestone as a planning mechanism and then see what um, what the status is, you know, how many are completed and uh, how many are still open. Um, optionally, you can assign dates to them. There's not really any meaning other than when you look at the roadmap, you can kind of get a sense of it. Um, you know, some teams who use the roadmap will tie it to a specific Fedora Linux release if that's sort of what they're working towards. Uh, for a lot of things like the Elections app, there's sort of a release associated target in that that's when the Elections app tends to be used, but it's really a release of the application itself. Um, and so it'll be a version number. And so depending on what a team is working on and how it, um, you know, how it's doing its development or its work, uh, that will depend on how the roadmap is used, if it's used. 
um, roadmaps are per repository. Um, so you can't really have multiple roadmaps for subsections. Um, you could create different milestones that each relate to the subsection, but they'll still all appeal, appear on the same roadmap. So similarly, you can create Kanban boards and use those. Um, and those can, you can have multiple of those per, um, per repository. So for the old Fedora project schedule one, I had one for the elections interviews. So anything tagged with election would be put on it. And this is really how I used it to track state because the way that would work is a candidate would submit an, an interview. I would enter it into WordPress. I would send them a link to review it. It would review, it would get published, and then uh, it would be done. And so, you know, it's you know very simple, very basic Kanban functionality. You can drag a uh, card from uh, column to column, and these are all just issues. Um, and then when I drag it into published, it knows to close them. Um, you can't do some of the fancier things that you can do in, for example, uh, Taiga, where you can set swim lanes and work in progress limits and things like that. This is a very simple functionality. Um, if you're familiar with like Trello, uh, especially a few years ago when it was much simpler, it's you know very the very basics of card moves from one column to another. Uh, but it can be very useful for tracking state um, when a group is mostly working in Pagger and also um, this doesn't need a lot of the robustness that other Kanban tools provide. Okay, so let's talk about the administration a little bit. Um, you know, all the settings are in the settings tab. Um, so the first thing to know is that you will probably be prompted to log in again when you go to the settings, just you know, sort of as an extra layer of security. Um, so you can set project details. There are a ton of project settings along the side here. I'm not going to hit all of them, but sort of the main ones, um, and the documentation covers the rest of them in, in depth. Um, but the first thing to know about is the users and groups. So you can add users, and you can add groups. And these groups are not the same as um, Fedora account groups, unfortunately. They're unique within the Pagger system. Um, so if you're an administrator of a group, um, you can go in and edit that group. You can see the members, um, and you can um, see the projects. Um, you can change the group. You can give it away to somebody. You can also create a new group, um, the same way you would create a new project. Um, and the members, it's basically members. Like there's not um, not really tiers of membership. So the way you handle different le levels of access are with the roles. So, for example, I'm the main admin on this repo. Uh, Marie, as the uh, F cake, is the is an admin on this repo because her job is partly to be a um, backstop for the elections issues. Uh, and then I also added the um, BGM team as an admin. So you can change the access levels and they're described here, but basically admin can edit all the settings and things like that. There is um, commit level access where you can basically do anything except change the settings. Um, a collaborator can um, do most things but can't uh, can only commit to certain branches and then um, ticket access basically means you can only edit the metadata of an issue um, and by default anyone with n with no specifically defined level of access can open issues can view public issues they can view their own private issues and they can close their issues um, so, you know, in general, you'd want to have a couple people with at, at least with admin access. Generally, maybe an entire team's group uh, would be an admin. And then if they're sort of peripheral contributors who, you know, might commit to the repo but don't need to access um, the settings, you would give them commit. Um, ticket, because it doesn't provide a lot of um, additional uh, ability beyond um, 
just being able to in interact with repos. Most people don't use that level of access very often. Um, but if you want people to be able to access metadata and you don't have to explicitly add them, um, so say you want people to be able to automatically create um, or ad automatically add labels when they open an issue, for example, uh, there is a setting in project options um, where you can open the metadata access to all. So that means any authenticated user can um, change labels, change milestones, change assignee, things like that. Um, for a lot of projects, that's probably fine. Some you might want to be more specific about it. Um, you can also toggle here whether issues default to private or not. Um, you can also set the issue tracker as read only. You can even disable an issue tracker if you really just want it for code management purposes. Um, and there are other settings, of course, you can look at more. Um, so we talked about the tags. So that's its own separate uh, setting. Um, you create these manually and you can delete them. So basically what you do is you give it a name, you give it a description, and you set a color by picking it somewhere on this color wheel. Um, I think they all default to black. Like There's no randomization of the color, um, which is a little unpleasant, but that's OK. Um, and then, of course, tags can be assigned to issues and pull requests, and uh, they can have multiple tags. To manage boards, you can add or delete a board. Um, and as you see here, it's based on if it's, um, has an associated tag with it. You give it a name, decide if it's active or not, and you can configure it. And this is basically where you set the different statuses. Um, you choose one default status, and you can have multiple statuses where it will close the issue, and you can pick which closed status it uses. Um, so for example, published is closed if somebody's withdrawn or removed from the ballot because they didn't submit an interview or they changed their mind and decided not to run after all. Um, that's a different state on the board, but it's still closed and it's fixed. It's closed as invalid instead of fixed. Um, and then, of course, from here, you can go and actually see the board. So as you can see, board management is very uh, simple. There's not a lot of features, but that also makes it very easy to understand and work with. You can also um, create custom fields. And so you might call it Bob. And you can choose different field types, which will just do a little bit of validation on it. Um, these are all pretty straightforward. Um, and of course, you can delete custom fields when you're done if you don't want to use those anymore. Um, you can have different closed statuses. So, you know, for one team, it may just be it's closed. Don't care the different statuses. For some, you might want to say, um, you know, if it's used, if the repository is mostly used for voting on issues, it might be approved, rejected, withdrawn, or invalid. Um, if it's for code, it might be you know, duplicate, fixed, insufficient data, or invalid, um, things like that. And so, you know, it's very customizable to how a particular team is using the issues. Um, and you can even have sort of, a, if you have a mix of both like code and voting, you can, you know, create different um, statuses for each of those. On the roadmap, um, we talked about you know having different milestones with a name, an optional date. You can set the order, and then you can toggle which ones are active. If you're working on a board that has old milestones, you can show the old milestones as well, or turn them off if there are too many. Um, I talked about priorities a little bit. By default, there are no priorities, but you can add new ones, and you can give them a weight. Um, the lower the weight, the higher the priority. So you might have like one OMG on fire. And then 10 is better hurry. And 100 is everything is chill. Obviously, you'd probably want to use more descriptive ones. Um, the Fedora Council ticket issue queue suffers from some very undescriptive um, priorities. Uh, and it also tends to use 
Um, the priority is also to indicate blocked status, which is probably not the best way to do it. It's just one of those things I haven't gotten around to coming up with a proposal yet. Um, some teams will also use labels to indicate if something is blocked or stalled or whatever reason. Um, so it's basically just you know whatever workflow works best for the people using it. One other neat feature that it doesn't get used much, um, but I've started using it on the program management team repo is there are things called quick replies where you can um, put in uh, it's basically text that you want to be able to add to an issue very quickly. And so you put in the same markdown formatting that you have. Um, the difficulty is because they don't have labels. It just basically shows you the first 50 characters. Um, so you want to make it a little clear if you have multiple ones, which one it is. Um, so you could use um, you know, the HTML comment characters to say, give it a label and that shouldn't appear when you actually um, preview it. So you can see this in action if you go to the issues. Um, so I, if there's a little drop down here, if there are uh, quick replies configured and you would select it and then when you preview it, you see the HTML comment went away. Um, so this is really handy if it's being used um, by for people with external bug report kind of things where you know, you know you're going to need to ask them every time, hey, you know, please provide this, 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 and this. Um, or if you have just other sort of procedural things where, um, you know, you find yourself typing the same thing over and over again, I just sort of save some keystrokes and also uh, provides um, a little bit of uh, consistency in the messaging. Similarly, uh, but managed more difficultly, there is um, templates that you can use for issues. So I will show you that. So the issue templates feature is a lot older. It's a little more complex. So it uh, it's managed a little different way. So when you go to a clone or repo, you see there's other Git URLs drop down. And there's one for issues, um, also one for pull requests. But for the issues one, what that gives you is essentially uh, a text, a JSON file um, of all of your issues, but also lets you create templates. So I've got the Fedora project schedules issues repo checked out. And so you can see there's a whole bunch of files there. They're just um, you know, basically with a UUID, so I can just um, you know, tap one and look at it. So uh, this is basically a JSON file of um, the contents and metadata for an issue. That's not particularly helpful, although you can use it to migrate issues from one repository to another, I think. Um, but the really useful part is this templates directory. So if you go to the templates directory, you see markdown files, we look at the council election directory, it says, you know, these are basically the interview questions that we use for the council elections. So when somebody creates an issue in that repository, they can select from the templates and then load the template and um, it'll give you the, inst the instructions and the text for them to fill in. So this is really helpful if you want people to, you know, up front before they even, um, provide any information is here's the stuff we're going to ask you for. Um, in the URL, you can even specify um, uh, which template you want to use with template equals and then the name. Um, so that'd be the name of the file without the .md. Um, so you can use you can use this URL and like put that in documentation or things like that to automatically point people to the right template. Uh, as soon as they click the link to open the issue. Um, but because this is done through a, um, a Git repo, you actually have to Git pull and then Git push to update the templates. You can't edit it through the, uh, the UI um, or the 
um, like the normal like editing in the files interface because it doesn't show up in the files. It's it's a separate repository that's sort of attached to the code repository. Um, so it's a very powerful and useful tool to set up a template, but it is a little bit of a you have to remember to do it slightly differently, um, and you have to remember to clone this uh, special repo.